Oh, let's try for audience participation. Good morning. All right, there we go. Welcome to the uh, Scenic Conference of 2014. Got record numbers of people here. It's great. Good to see everybody. This is our first time at uh, CSU. So we want to thank Ruben Armiano, Jason Wenrick, Sonoma State. Thank all of them. This is, uh, gee, I've been chair of the board a little over a year here, and I'm, I'm learning new things every day from uh, all the staff, especially Lewis. I just found out this morning that NLR stands for no longer relevant. <laughs> I had no idea. Uh, I, I, I do want to take a moment and, uh, and thank um, the scenic staff. It's, it's really, it really has been a terrific year. It, it's wonderful that we're all up here. You know, when they have these conferences, they think, well, should they be next to an airport? Should we be at a supercomputer? It turns out we just need to be in wine country, and then everybody, <laughs> everybody shows up. Um, so uh, my thanks to, to the staff. I mean, it's, it's really been a tremendous year. Um, we've had the 100 gig project. We've had the coastal access project. We've had the Central Valley project. We're extending service to libraries. We're moving out to arts and culture. It's wonderful. And so I'd like us all to pause a moment and, and give the scenic staff a big round of applause. <laughs> I'd also like to take a moment here and uh, introduce uh, a, a friend and a, and a guy that really has helped make all this happen for Scenic in a, in a new way that's been really exciting. So I'd like to take a moment and uh, introduce Lewis Fox, our President and CEO. Thanks, Bill, and, and uh, welcome to uh, the 18th um, uh, Scenic Annual Conference. Um, this uh, is, uh, as at this point, the largest attendance since um, 2007. Um, I wanted to take a minute and, and also recognize some folks. Um, the Scenic Board uh, is it's a voluntary role, and they are um, uh, uh, stewards and, and, and leaders of uh, a lot of resources that support the network and support um, uh, the 10,000 or so um, institutions that connect behind the Scenic uh, Network. And there are a number of board members who uh, will be here uh, over the next couple of days and uh, they have a little, uh, it's, it's, it, it seems a little f funereal. They have this black thing on their, uh, <laughs> on, on their uh, uh, badges, but um, if you see them, um, thank them for their service. They are, are serving on your behalf um, and, uh, and doing a really great job of it. Um, we also have a number of um, folks who are here from the Technical Advisory Committees, um, and they are absolutely essential to the technical directions um, that Scenic takes. And also we have, uh, like a lot of boards, we have um, you know, business committees and audit committees and so on, and uh, a number of folks who um, are, are either on the board or, or just simply volunteer on, uh, on those committees um, are with us as well um, over the next couple of days. Um, this is a big year for us. Um, uh, one of the things I, I do uh, uh, want to thank is all the people from the library community who are here. Um, this is the this is the first conference where we have had uh, a significant focus um, on uh, public libraries, and we're looking forward to um, bringing on the roughly 1,200 or so public libraries in California onto the scenic network over the next uh, year or two. Um, we also have um, participants from cult cultural, scientific, and arts organizations who are uh, in larger numbers beginning to join join the network, and later in the program. There's kind of a uh, historic uh, event um, that we're working on with uh, institutions around the state um, led by um, SF Jazz. Um, and uh, it'll be an experiment. It'll be fun to see. Um, I, I, we're hoping it works. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I'm sure you'll um, all be forgiving and generous about it. Um, lastly, I wanted to thank the sponsors. Um, putting on these conferences is really not possible without, without sponsorship. Um, and we have a number of sponsors who are here in the room. Um, at the, uh, the sil silver, silver level, Alcatel, Lucent, and Charter. 
Um, the Gold Level, um, Aruba Networks, Juniper, Level 3, NCAS, Time Warner, and Zeo. At the Platinum Level, um, AT&T and Brocade. And at the Titanium Level, Cisco. Would you join me in giving a hand? <laughs> So I have, I have the great pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, um, Cliff Lynch. Um, Cliff is the Executive Director for the Coalition for Networked Information, CNI. I don't have a derisive um, uh, uh, way of, of like NLR, of CNI does great things, um, is really a, a, a thought leader. Um, they include roughly uh, 200 member organizations concerned with the intelligent uses of information technology and networked information to enhance scholarship and intellectual life. Um, prior to joining CNI, um, Cliff spent 18 years at the UC Office of the President, the last 10 as the Director of Library Automation. He has a PhD from, in Computer Science from UC Berkeley and is an adjunct professor at Berkeley School of Information. And most importantly, um, Cliff is, a, is a, uh, uh, a prolific writer and uh, speaks at many events. And for me, and I know for many of you who have heard Cliff speak before, it's just sort of wonderful to see what's going on in Cliff's mind at that particular time and day. <laughs> so uh, it, 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 is, it, it, it is, it's a wonderful mind, and uh, he's, a, he's a very uh, uh, thoughtful and eloquent, eloquent speaker, and we're delighted that he came to join us today. So Cliff, thanks. <laughs> Thanks. That was a, a very kind introduction indeed, and it really is lovely to be here. I had a chance to say hello briefly at least to a number of folks I haven't had the opportunity to really catch up with in a number of years. Um, uh, since the uh, days many, many years ago now when I was uh, heavily involved in uh, networking in California and beyond um, uh, through my role at uh, the uh, UC Office of the President. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to see how all of that has kind of um, rolled out across the, uh, the state over the, uh, over the past decades. Um, this morning, I want to talk about um, some ideas related to coherence and scale and to connect those to a series of large scale, and I mean genuinely large scale, like um, uh, in some cases creeping up towards social scale, systems that are starting to emerge out of the research and education community to do a number of things dealing with the support of scholarship, teaching, learning, research. Um, I think we're really at a, a pretty significant turning point for many of these systems. Um, and it, it's fascinating to me how the underlying networks have led the way in some of this through um, the emergence of things like Internet 2 um, and the, um, the system of regional networks that connect to that. And um, there, there, there's a lot of attention in other quarters now, for example, in um, uh, places like the library community within higher ed, um, looking back at that history and thinking about what they can learn from some of the um, uh, some of the history there to guide the deployment and the conceptualization of other kinds of um, uh, higher level, if you'll allow me the term, system. Um, you do hear a lot about higher level sorts of things. Um, uh, Internet 2 now speaks very explicitly of a set of activities that they characterize as above the net, um, where they are trying to um, uh, connect up um, and, and um, select and advance services uh, for their community that go w well above bit transport and uh, related sorts of things. Um, in the library world, uh, one of the um, popular phrases now is um, network level um, discovery. 
the notion that um, certain kinds of things really shouldn't be local to individual libraries anymore, um, but really should be viewed as national or even international collections of resources that are visible to the to the members of library communities everywhere. And that's an enormous um, psychological shift uh, that has a lot of ramifications. Um, uh, everything from the notion that um, you don't sort of search necessarily or discover by organizational arrangement, which is something we've been struggling to move away from for 40 years now um, and are getting more and more traction on, all the way through questions of responsibility. Um, who, who, who really is responsible for stewardship of things when they're just kind of out there and shared by everybody? A very scary prospect and um, one that I think many, many public institutions and institutions operating in the sort of public interest are facing now. I mean, the, the most extreme case of this, just to um, you know, give you a concrete example, is that um, as you well know, those of you in the in higher education, um, libraries purchase some scientific and scholarly journals at uh, prices that are, you know, genuinely astronomical at this point. Um, and they, of course, worry a lot about um, ensuring that that investment is going to be preserved, that those journals in electronic form will continue to be available in. Um, I don't want to say perpetuity, but let's just say for a really long time for their users. But at the same time, we see scholars starting new journals, some of them very important and very significant, that are free for everybody. They're basically funding them out of um, some other set of arrangements, subs institutional subsidies, author fees, you name it. Um, but they're free. So. If you look at the community at a university, they are using some of these very expensive journals licensed by the library. And equally important, they're using these free journals that are just out there. Now, are those free journals part of the library's collection? Yeah. Who's really got it gonna step up in the long term to ensure that those survive and continue to be accessible? Those are the kinds of, of displacements we're fighting with in this, um, in this universe. We're coming out of a period of sort of let a thousand flowers bloom, um, which has been amazing and has been going on for, you know, 25 years or so since the network really got stable and got out there to scholars to start changing the way they do their work and they communicate their work. Um, nowhere can you see this more prominently perhaps than in the humanities where you actually saw a period which I think f is starting to not come to an end but taper off now where um, humanists came to the network looking at it almost as a clean slate and were invited to do things like say, well, I would have published a monograph in print, but now I have this digital canvas. How do I reconceptualize the monograph in the digital world? How do I make my arguments and present them and support them in the most effective way on this digital canvas? And actually what happened there was both very exciting. People tried a lot of things. Some of them worked. And also very disappointing in a couple of ways. Um, one was some of these humanists just had their heads explode because <laughs> They started out trying to make a point about the scholarship of something, you know, medieval manuscripts or something, and then got diverted into this, you know, 10 year question of reconceiving what the monograph look, should look like to make that argument, and winding up spending, you know, 15 years on something that should have been a three year monograph. Um, the other bad thing was that. Um, 
while we learned a lot from some of those, and of course some of those developments kind of moved into the mainstream, um, we also were left with a lot of one-off projects, um, which are going to be absolute horrors to preserve in the long run. So we're starting now to think much more explicitly about scale, about the fact that if you are going to have a preservable scholarly discourse, everything can't be a complete one-off. Um, it is not, while no one wants to prevent a genuinely interested um, author from exploring, um, you know, everything that the digital medium can afford to his or her um, uh, arguments and expressions, um, <laughs> it actually looks like there's a tremendous win in giving people, most people, the vast majority of the people whose focus is on disciplinary scholarship, templates of various kinds, platforms of various kinds that are, in, you know, customizable within certain parameters but not a blank canvas. So we are starting to see those kinds of transitions happen. We're starting to see people think about platforms, about sustainability. Um, we are moving away from a period where every digital library or similar information resource seemed to be built ground up and custom um, to a time when the engineering of these things becomes a bit more routine and a bit more, I don't want to say standardized, but in a sense it is sort of standardized. Um, the interfaces get much more standardized and the software platforms get much less numerous. They don't go down to one, but they get less numerous. So what I want to do is kind of take you in the next half hour or so on a fast survey through some of those developments and um, how they are, they are changing the focus of things. Yes? I, I believe we are using the microphone. No, this one is, um, is for the webcast. Um, I will try and talk into it more and talk louder, but I, I'm pretty sure it's running. Let's check. You know, it wasn't. Is that better? No. Okay. Uh, we will. We will continue on. Um, okay. Uh, a little better. Okay. So. Um, let me, um, let me talk first a little bit about some changes in scholarly practice because these drive so much. Um, you know, it's, it's a common place to talk about how scholarly communication, for example, is changing, but that is really the wrong place to start. The right place to start is how people are doing scholarship and how that has changed. And that, in turn, um, is, is what's driving a lot of the changes, I think, in scholarly communication. And I don't need to tell the people here about how high performance networking has changed the world there. I don't think I need to talk about how access to high performance computing has changed the world there. But the latest and in some ways, I think most profound wave that is washing over us now is the flood of data that has emerged. The fact that almost every scholarly discipline, ranging from the humanities all the way through the physical sciences, the life sciences, medicine, engineering, architecture, all of these things have become enormously data intensive. And being able to find data, share data, reuse data, recombine data have become essential scientific practices. One of the great sets of questions today is how we preserve that data, who is responsible for preserving it, how we make decisions about what to keep and how long to keep it, and how we connect data with more traditional scholarly literature. So if you look in areas like um, genomics and biomedicine now, you actually see the underlying data 
interwoven with papers um, so that you can navigate back and forth um, uh, into, uh, inside of systems that actually combine them. In other cases, you see data much more as a kind of a, a referential underpinning um, where you point out to various kinds of reference data sets or databases. Um, and uh, we are seeing a huge set of policy issues emerge around this. Some of you may have been tracking the policy debate in the United States, and I'll note that it is also occurring in other countries, particularly within Europe, um, as well as on a pan-European basis through the European Commission. But fundamentally, what this debate is about is the public access to publicly funded research. So the notion is you pay taxes. Those taxes support a lot of federally funded research through institutions like the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, the National Endowment for the Humanities, on and on and on. Um, and that given that you paid for this, it seems kind of reasonable that you ought to be able to have access to the results. And those results include both publications describing the outcomes of that research and also data that is captured as a part of that research. And there has been an ongoing public policy debate, probably running for 10 years or more, um, about making that a reality. Uh, right now, the National Institutes of Health do insist that um, publications arising from NIH grants become available within a, a fairly short embargo period after publication. And that's the easiest case to make. Um, that was a case that was made, um, be, and of course, many of the publishers don't like this very much for obvious reasons, but that was a compelling case that you could make before Congress and before the public broadly because biomedical research is particularly crucial. You could bring in parents and children uh, who were struggling with, um, you know, uh, children with um, illnesses, parents with illnesses, saying, why can't I get access to the latest research results so that I can make better decisions about the care of my family? That is a very compelling case to make. Um, and, um, uh, you know, they made it. Uh, they made it publicly, they made it on television, they made it in front of Congress, and that one carried the day. It is a little bit more um, esoteric, shall we say, to say that the Department of Energy has been paying these um, string theorists to write some very difficult to understand papers about the 11-dimensional um, uh, universe that they um, believe our sort of normal reality sits within. And I should have access to those papers immediately because I helped through my taxes to pay them. That's logical, but it doesn't carry the same emotional bang. Um, we are moving on from the emotion to the logic at this point. The Office of Science and Technology Policy, which is an instrument of the White House that does exactly what it sounds like, um, basically told every federal funding agency that spends over, I think it's $100 million a year, um, fairly small money by federal standards, they basically told them to prepare regulations to attach to their grants that ensured that after a limited embargo period, both the underlying data and the publications resulting from those grants would be publicly available. And those draft regulations have been returned to the Office of Science and Technology Policy. They are under review there in part because OSTP really doesn't want 30 conflicting sets of regulations out of 30 different funding agencies. 
Um, and uh, we've been waiting for the last few months for them to go public. They are not public at the moment. Um, they're still under internal review. But that will basically usher in a period in the US where we will have public access to a great deal more of the outcomes of research than we do today. I would note that a number of private funders and um, non-governmental, non-federal governmental funders are getting on the same bandwagon. So you see very large institutions like the Wellcome Trust, the Howard Hughes Medical Foundation, um, the Mellon Foundation, starting to pick up on the same kinds of um, requirements in the arrangements they make for grants. Um, so there is a serious movement here to open up research for the public. And that means we need systems that um, we don't have today to do that. Uh, there is a, um, a system under design um, in the higher ed world called SHARE, which is intended to um, both provide literature access and at least provide registries for being able to manage lo the location of research data. Um, I could talk for the rest of the morning about issues related to research data. Um, and I am going, and indeed, CNI has spent a tremendous amount of its time over the past decade looking at those issues. Um, I am mostly going to restrain myself and just make a couple of points that I think um, uh, might be useful for you all to keep in mind. First off, um, we are not going to be able to keep all research data forever. Um, we will run out of space. Uh, we will also run out of money. We do not have a good um, framework, a good analytic framework today for deciding what to keep and what not to keep. Um, it is a complicated melange of ethical considerations. For example, um, it seems pretty crummy to uh, have to run a new clinical trial 10 years from now that puts a new co cohort of humans at risk because you were too cheap to keep the data from the last one. Um, you know, th th there you have what feels like an ethical argument. Um, you can probably extend that um, if you're so inclined to say that, you know, data sets produced by tormenting animals, um, uh, you know, probably should have some privileged status in retention. You can argue that observational data, because it's sort of irreplaceable, maybe should be privileged over experimental data when you can always rerun the experiment until you start thinking about building a new Large Hadron Collider 20 years from now so that you can rerun the experiment because somebody thinks you messed up the analysis on the first set of data. Um, this is going to be a very tough set of issues for um, the world collectively to work through. And this is a place, by the way, where it shouldn't stay all inside scholarship and inside the research and education community. There are strong public interests in this as well, um, and we need a pretty broad-ranging conversation. Um, so that's one, that's one thing to be alert on. A second one is that um, a lot of research data really isn't that big, and the difficulty is mostly in describing it and understanding what it means, not finding bit storage for it. Um, we tend to run away, get, get you know, carried away with the poster children, the Large Hadron Collider, this, um, uh, these, these telescopic arrays we're building. There's about a, a dozen or so of these hero science projects that um, you know, are deliberately designed to swamp our networks, swamp our computation, swamp our storage um, capabilities. And as soon as we catch up with them, they you know, crank up the resolution another uh, order of magnitude, and here we are again. Um, and you know, there will always be a piece of science, uh, particularly, uh, and of scholarly work that sits on the fringes of what we can support with our IT. 
Um, but there's a whole lot of it that doesn't call for that. You know what the most popular um, uh, storage format is for scientific data? Excel spreadsheets. I kid you not. Um, and in fact, there has been some very clever recent work um, by a consortium that includes Microsoft Research, um, the California Digital Library, um, uh, Data One, which is an NSF funded project, to basically build preservation tools for Excel spreadsheets. Um, you really, you really need to kind of find out what that data looks like. And I'm, I'm not too worried that we're going to run out of space for those real soon. So that's a second point I want to make. Um, a third, two, two more points. Um, discovering data is really hard. It's easy within a very constrained space where people are talking about either monotype data or um, situations where um, there is strong consensus about how to describe data in detail, what a specific data set. When you start talking about reusing data across disciplinary boundaries, exactly the kinds of things we do to under, need to do to understand something like the social effects of climate change or um, economics and how they relate to um, uh, pollution or something like that, where you're drawing in data from lots of sources, it's really tough to characterize that data so that people can discover it, and that's a big challenge. The last one that I'll highlight for you in the data area before moving on is um, data about people. We have spent a long time trying to develop policies and practices that protect human subjects. Um, that has its roots, of course, in medical trials of various kinds and in um, some very horrible things that have been done in the past. Um, it has wandered into uh, areas well beyond those roots um, in the social sciences for example, and um, there is now actually, again, in the United States, a debate starting to emerge about um, whether we really have kind of got the boundaries of managing and the underlying principles about human subjects data right or whether we need to rethink it a little bit. But nonetheless, today we have this big investment happening um, in protecting the dignity and the privacy of individuals whose data is used for very scholarly purposes. At the same time, we have the prospect that by recombining that data, by linking, for example, genomic data, environmental data, uh, economic data, and uh, health records, we can um, make major breakthroughs in uh, biomedical sciences and other areas. These two are kind of antithetical. And I foresee a very lengthy negotiation as we try and balance these two demands. Um, there are interesting things going on in other countries. Um, you may be aware, for example, that in the UK they have a national health service. Basically, health care to a first approximation comes through the government. And one of the side effects of that is they have a national health record system, a sort of a central health records database. Um, I don't want to suggest it's a real high quality database necessarily, but they have one. Um, the government there, about two years ago, established a policy whereby unless you explicitly opt out, as a British resident or citizen receiving care from the National Health Service, your records will be made available for data mining to for-profit and not-for-profit um, uh, companies uh, by the British government. 
um, who plans to cut deals around this National Health Service database. Now, they will be anonymized at some level. Um, we can talk about anonymization another time. Um, I think those of you who've been anywhere near it realize it's really, really hard to do. Um, but uh, that just kind of shows you the way different countries are starting to think about these data assets. And again, I'd point out that while there's a strong research and education interest here, the implications of this go well beyond research and education. But let me talk, let, let me leave behind this and talk just a little bit about some of the other big emergent systems that we're starting to see. So I mentioned, um, I mentioned SHARE a little earlier. That is uh, basically a sort of a notification and uh, content tracking system. Um, it also deals with a lot of conformance issues. We're seeing that use a shared infrastructure of institutional repositories that have been established at many of our educational institutions. Those are also playing an important role in preservation of data that, that insti those institutional communities are being, um, are, are producing and trying to steward in t forward in time. Um, there is a large-scale effort to build something called DPN, the Digital Preservation Network, which would provide a kind of a backup level of deep storage, uh, replicated storage, um, and would actually uh, be fairly closely tied to some of the key points on the Internet 2 uh, backbone so that you could get data into those backup sites um, from a wide variety of institutions. Uh, DPN is still relatively young, but it is interesting to me in that it is an effort to think about preservation at scale rather than these kind of point solutions we've developed so far to deal with things like scholarly journals specifically. Um, DPN is relatively is in its design relatively indifferent to the um, kind of data that goes in it. Um, it is worth saying, I think, when we talk about preservation of digital content, and here I'm talking really beyond um, just scholarly material to you know, this sort of broad cultural record and to the base of evidence that is needed to support future scholarship, which includes a ton of mass media kinds of things today. Um, you know, just as we study the novels of the 19th century, the popular novels for insight into what they were thinking and how they were feeling, people are going to want to do that with today's um, you know, mass entertainments, novels, TV, video games, you name it. Um, all of that stuff has a place in the preservation of the cultural record to support future scholarship. As a more mundane example, think about news and newspapers, um, an absolutely critical resource to understanding the past and one that we are doing a very shaky job of managing uh, the preservation of in the present. One of the things that's really striking um, is that we don't know how well or badly we're doing in most areas of preservation of that cultural record. Uh, we have a little bit of data on a few things. For example, we have a registry that deals with scholarly journals called Keepers, um, which gives us some sense of what's going on there. Um, but as you look at how um, many of our industries producing cultural product are metamorphosizing today, um, we really are sort of at a loss for how well we're doing. 20 years ago, the book industry put out pretty good data about how many books were being, how many titles were being published in America this year. How many in paperback, how many in hardcover. Not perfect, but pretty good. Now, 
just think about this. Um, today, you have this sort of madhouse where um, you have publishers going independent. You have distribution channels like Amazon and Apple also acting as publishers. And many of these people do not share data. Um, how many uh, independently published work books do you think are on Amazon today for sale as e-books? Well, um, I don't know. And I don't think anybody else knows either outside of uh, Amazon Central. They, don't, they are very um, secretive with their data. I can tell you one data point that they threw out in a press release about uh, the Christmas season, where they claimed to have gathered up 200,000 new exclusive Amazon Kindle titles in 2013. 200,000. That's a lot of books that aren't in anybody's preservation stream if they are exclusive to Amazon. We could go on and explore how video production and distribution is getting restructured. We could have a conversation about the music industry and how music is marketed and acquired uh, today. Um, suffice it to say that um, they all kind of look like this. So one of the big challenges we actually face now is getting a handle on the size of the preservation problem and how to attack it structurally so that we can actually make statements, even if they're depressing statements, like we're doing worse this year than we did last year, we would ideally like to be able to say we're doing better than we were last year and that for so many millions of additional dollars we can do that much better. Uh, we're a long way from that right now. Um, I'll mention a couple of other things quickly and I am mindful of the time and I want to get at least a uh, couple minutes in for uh, a question or two. So. One of the new things that has emerged that's very interesting um, in the world of making available various kinds of scholarly and cultural resources is that this is no longer a matter mostly of storage and network costs. If you think about the old fashioned picture of humans interacting with various kinds of content resources. You can think of someone finding an article and reading it page by page, or going to a museum, putting in a query, finding six images, and spending some time staring at them. That's the way many people who design systems, um, particularly of my generation, are kind of deeply ingrained in thinking about interaction with information resources. Nowadays, many of the queries that scholars want to run against those resources are structural queries. There are data mining queries. There are things like, I'd like to see a graph uh, by year of the number of times that this phrase was used in the novels of the 18th century. This is not pull up a page and stare at it for a while. This is a significant bit of computation. Or in a museum, think, of, think about museums for a minute. Now, um, one of the things you may or may not know is particularly large encyclopedic museums have a lot more stuff than they show. Um, if you get into the really big ones, they may have two or three or four percent of their holdings on display. The rest of it is warehoused, but they've, all, they've got digital images of all of it now, or increasingly they do, as they image as part of their inventory and collection management. So you can now ask very different sorts of questions. Rather than going and admiring this beautiful example of a Greek vase from a certain period, you can say, I'd like to compute the sort of um, 
abstract average Greek vase from that period over the images of your entire collection and then start looking at some of the ones that are outliers. This is the sort of thing you could spend a career as a scholar um, building up the intuition around in times past. And now you can actually think about formulating as a query as a middle school student in art history class. We face an enormous challenge in provisioning the computation for this. You are now seeing strange and wonderful ideas pop up. For example, you put um, data resources someplace like Amazon. And you basically say to the scholars, we put the data up. If you want to do these kind of compu computations on it, um, buy yourself some Amazon compute time and do it. Um, we can't afford to underwrite these kind of open-ended computations. This is a total departure in thinking about how a lot of cultural materials may be used in the future. Um, one of the things, one of the other very large scale activities that's worth mentioning um, related to discovery systems is the uh, recent launch of the um, Digital Public Library of America. And I would also invite you to have a look at a system called Europeana, which has been um, built in Europe and is not, it had, shares some similarities with DPLA. Um, the Digital Public Library of America, and I know you have a session on it, and I think you'll find it very interesting, um, uh, is, is an unfortunately named but wonderful project. Um, uh, it really has nothing to do with digital public libraries for America. Uh, and it would have it, it been much better to follow the Europeans' lead and call it Colombiana or you know, Americana or something um, more neutral uh, that didn't fire off all of these um, expectations and confusions. But basically what it is is it's a very large scale discovery tool for cultural materials in museums, in archives, in libraries, all over the country. Um, it's a wonderful kind of an idea that pushes out discovery of cultural material at scale. Um, and uh, um, I think it again reflects this sort of thinking about um, how can we genuinely operate at scale. And they have a whole kind of um, underlying infrastructure developing there because they want very small institutions to be able to participate. And so you've got a whole question of how to get technical expertise out to them, how to get hosting facilities out to them, all of those questions. And um, unless I very much miss my guess, um, DPLA will be something that will be important to keep on Scenic's radar screen, particularly as you continue to reach out to public libraries and cultural institutions of all kinds. I will close with a, a final piece of infrastructure which, uh, or large scale system building, it's actually both, which I think will have some interesting echoes for some of the more technical networking folks here. Um, and it's a place where CNI has again been spending quite a bit of time in the last couple of years understanding what's going on. So here's the deal. Um, in the research and higher education world, at least, we have been committing a lot of institutional resources over the past decade to identity management. Uh, basically, figuring out who people are and who, who they, whether they are who they say they are and what level of assurance to assign to that and then dealing with various kinds of attributes and authorization surrounding that. So you see work like edge a person um, and you see a very, um, you know, uh, rapidly snowballing now trend to um, deal with this on at least a limited interinstitutional basis through identity federations and now through um, 
pushing up levels of assurance into those identity management federations. Um, this is really important stuff. You can't do resource sharing at scale without this, um, uh, other than resources that are fully public. Um, and we are going to find, I believe, there are a whole lot of resources that are going to be relatively public, but not fully public, and other resources that we need to share widely, but on a highly controlled basis. We're going to see the whole spectrum of use cases show up. And so this is wonderful work that's going forward. At the same time, we have seen a resurgence of um, what I would characterize, and this is kind this is my phrase and not one that's widely accepted, at least not yet, as factual biography. Here's what I mean by that. Um, so what you want is you want, first of all, agreement and cross-referencing around the names that people use for various activities. So um, uh, many people publish under names that are a little different than the names they get their paychecks from. Some people, as they alter their, um, their uh, status going through life, um, add and drop or hyphenate names um, uh, um, with partners. Some people, um, just for all kinds of interesting reasons, um, are known popularly by nicknames or want to use pseudonyms to keep different activities um, separate. It's very common, for example, if you see an academic who also writes um, fiction in his or her spare time uh, to use one name for their scholarly works and then a different name for their um, fiction. So you cross-reference those, or you'd like to. Then the next thing you want to do is hang a bunch of biographical information on here. And here's where the, I, I use this term factual biography. Um, the idea is this is the sort of stuff that would be on a CV. These are public events. Um, if you publish something, that's generally considered a public event. You kind of you know, put it out there on your, with your name on it for people to read. Um, there are a number of other sorts of things. The award of government grants um, is typically a matter of public record. Um, birth, death, uh, military service, certain kinds of awards, degrees. As I say, a lot of the kinds of things you see on a resume. And we see a great interest now in, among scholars in getting their bibliographies right because of the use of impact factors in tenure and promotion and evaluating grant proposals. Um, you see the mess that um, is Microsoft Scholar or, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, Google Scholar or Microsoft Academic, where if you look yourself up, you find other people's things under you and you under three variations of your name. And scholars are trying to go through and basically make sure that they are represented by uh, these sort of accurate factual CVs, which it turns out you need to interchange with a lot of systems now. You need to interchange them with institutional systems that deal with tenure and promotion and faculty achievement. You need to interchange them with government systems that um, uh, manage supporting data for grants. You also want to use them in recommender systems. Um, you see a lot of interest in systems like uh, Vivo, for example, that basically help scholars to find c potential collaborators by building on these kinds of databases. So one of the really central questions that is starting to surface and fast is, how are we going to converge the sort of um, strongly institutionally based um, infrastructure of identity management with this broader world of scholarly identity and factual biography. 
what levels of assurance are needed where? Um, is, is there, for example, um, a, a genuine need to make verifiable assertions here, or can you just deal with that on a kind of an on-demand basis? Um, at least one scholarly publisher now will give you a digitally signed thing that basically confirms that indeed you published this article with them. Uh, so, you know, that article you used to dress up your resume with uh, now is checkable. Um, so, uh, you could do that in theory with university degrees, for example, um, which would uh, do a good deal of deflating of resumes, I fear, out in the private sector. Um, but this is, this is part of the conversation we are starting to see around there. Just to, just to make sure you fully understand how complicated this is, though, it has aspects going forward and going backwards. You have databases today that deal with mathematical genealogy, that deal with the achievements of generations of scholars and scientists that are, you know, long gone. Who's going to clean up their biographies? Um, we need to. There is a whole tradition of national literary biography that connects into this. So you really want this not just for today, but for today and, and sliding into the history of, of scholarship and, and society. And I think this is going to be one of the most fascinating pieces of the large scale um, uh, engineering of, of coherent systems, in part because, as you know from our early experiences with fundamental identity management, it tends to creep into everything and um, become, you know, one of the most pervasive bits of, of, of infrastructure out there for layering other kinds of services on. So that is a very fast survey of some of the some of the response, I think, to this focus that is emerging on scale, on coherence, on um, sustainability and manageability of our sort of key um, information technology enabled uh, activities in the research and higher education community. Uh, I think that there is, as I indicated at the opening of my talk, a very interesting kind of intellectual continuity um, starting with the struggles and the um, insights that the higher ed and research community has had with its basic networking that echoes up through the development of these other um, systems for um, uh, more complex and elaborately defined functions um, and in some cases uh, not, not crisply defined functions yet. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's always been a little easier to say um, what you want underlying networks to do than what you want the services that sit on top of them to do. And the more layers of services, the more challenging that gets. Um, I do think that the consequences of this are quite substantial. I think that among them it suggests to me a period of a lot less kind of haphazard experimentation without exit strategies. I think it suggests a more engineering based approach to certain things. Um, something where you actually before you start building it um, do some fairly serious analysis about cost and performance and design alternatives. And I would say that, you know, that really has not been a systematic character of, of a lot of the system design going above the fundamental le network level in higher education in recent decades. It has been much more an experimentally driven sort of thing, demo or die. and then. Once the demo gets some traction, keep building it out and hope you can stay ahead of demand. Um, there will always be a place for that, but I think that the world where that is the, um, you know, driving culture may diminish a bit 
in the next round of the cycle. I thank you very much. I think we have just a minute or two for a question, if uh, we can stretch it out. And I would welcome a question or a comment or two. Yes. The question was about, in cross-disciplinary data sharing, has there been much progress in uh, schema standardization and um, thus uh, a reduction of the need to do schema translators? Um, my sense is not very much. Um, there have been some fairly well-developed ontologies in certain areas that have been you know, adopted beyond those uh, areas. Um, I would say that is particularly true in the biomedical sciences and some pieces of astronomy and astrophysics. Um, I think actually, sadly, in many cases, um, if we could just get them to define schemas, we'd be ahead of the game, because then you can start talking about automatic translation. Um, in all too many fields, they are still you know, way back at the beginning stages of figuring out what they need schemas for. Um, and there's, it, it seems like this is a tough place to get funding. Um, and it's a very tough place to get academic recognition for. Um, the NSF Office of Cyber Infrastructure ran a fairly modest grant program called Interop for a few years, and I think they're hoping to bring that back to fund mostly conferences and fairly you know, low-level investment in people to get more of this kind of schema stuff drafted and documented. Because um, it's not really that expensive, it's just you don't generally get a lot of academic credit for developing schemas in different areas. You know, um, I mean, the, the, the crushing thing is you hear, you hear it said of scientists who've spent you know, um, much of their working career developing key data resources for their whole community. You know, well, they could have been a real scientist it's probably good for all of us that they went to do that, but somehow it's just not as good. Um, and that's got to change. Um, I think it will change, but I think it's, it's going to be a, a long, tough process. One more? Are we at break? We are at break. Thank you very much.